Thank you, Brother Johnny and Brother Mike. <laughs> I like that. We are stoked! <laughs> Otto Stokes, thank you for lending your name. <laughs> he mentioned about the need for us to go back to the Bible, you know, open the Bible. And I was looking at the Bible right there, my back. And uh, it looks like an old Bible, but the words written in this Bible are from God. Because they are preserved for us, because God knows that the time will come, maybe thousands of years after these were written, people will be put in difficult, challenging situations, and they don't know exactly what to do. And God preserved this Bible for us. And He challenges us to read the Bible, because the Bible has stories relevant for us. And so today, I'd like to talk to you about another story from the Bible. This is the story of Jonah, kind of similar to what the brother is saying here. Before that, let me relate to you a, a true story. This is a, a story that happened in 1929, Roy Riggles. He was an All-American center from the University of California, football player. His team was the Golden Bears and uh, facing the Georgia Tech Yellow Jacket. Roy was playing both offense and defense for his football team. And it was towards the end of the first half when somebody from the other team fumbled and dropped the ball. So Roy picked up the ball, was excited, and started running towards the goal as fast as he could, covering 65 yards. And there was one problem. He was running towards the opponent's goal. And uh, of course, the, the coach of the opponents said, he's running the wrong way, let's see how far he can go. And uh, he was really happy because this guy was just running. And uh, fortunately, one of, Roy's, one of Roy's teammate, Benny Long, took off in hot pursuit the wrong way, you know, Roy. Is, by the way, they started calling him Wrong Way Roy since that time. And he tackled him just before he crossed the wrong goal line. And of course, during that halftime recess, he was just so yeah. demolished and down and discouraged. And everyone was quiet in the room except Roy was sobbing and crying, actually. Uh, but uh, the coach was amazing because he said, Man, the same team that started the first half will be the same team that will start the second half. The coach gave him a second chance. But he was complaining, how can I? I fail the team. I I ran the wrong way, it's so embarrassing. I, I failed, my family he was just upset. But then he said, go, get up, Roy, and the game is only half over. Just remember, that's the goal. <laughs> and you know, that's, to make a long story short, he was the one, and he was instrumental, and their team won because of Roy, because he did his best afterwards. So the story is kind of the same with uh, Jonah. Here's God. God gave Jonah a mission. And Jonah grabbed and heard a mission. And he ran. But the wrong way. <laughs> Not the wrong way. Uh, so Jonah was afraid to do actually in this case. He was kind of scared to do his job. So he, he ran away. Uh, he was called uh, the original chicken of the sea. Because he was afraid. Yeah. Uh, but of course he, he realized that it is impossible to run from God. You know, you laughed. You know, I was thinking about what title I should give for my sermon. <laughs> Chicken of the Sea. I was thinking about uh, sushi in reverse. You know, man eating fish. Reverse is fish eating man. Right? Or I was thinking about... Uh, uh, eating your profits. <laughs> That's <a> good one. <laughs> right? Or truth that is hard to swallow. <laughs> so here's the story of this man. Uh, of course, we, you know, the people say it's a whale. Uh, maybe another title will be all swale. <laughs> uh, but Jesus. This is a true story. This is a story that has been criticized, 
But the thing is, Jesus validated the story as being true because he said, the story of John actually proves my messiahship. So Jesus himself validated that. So this is the story of a man with a mission. He was given a job to do. He was called by God, but he refused. You know, probably if you summarize the story, it can be said, God said, go. Joshua said, and Jonah said, no. And God said, oh. <laughs> it's a long story, so we're going to probably cut it short, you know. And we see here God's love and God's long suffering, God's patience, His willingness to forgive people who run away and maybe say, says no. So the book of Jonah could be, you know, something I think is written for us. A uh, very good story. It's a story that teaches us that sometimes. It takes God longer to prepare His servant and to get him to obey than it did for the entire godless city to be converted. It took God longer time to work with the servant and it's quicker to convert the whole city of Nineveh. I mean, isn't that amazing? Uh, it's almost the same as in the world today. Um, we tend to underestimate what God can do with people. Now, the assignment was difficult. Uh, really, a challenge for, for Jonah, and we understand that. Let's read now in Jonah 1, 1 to 3. Jonah 1, 1 to 3. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. And after paying his fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Now the command is for him to go to Nineveh, which is 500 miles, and Tarshish is 2,000 miles. He would rather travel 2,000 miles you know, he said up to 500 miles. And that was Jonah. It, it, he found it really difficult, you know, just to, to believe and to, to, obey, uh, to obey God. And it's a story of... Now, when I read this, I also think about myself. Because when, when I preach, I only not preach it to the church. But in all the preaching that I do, I think about my own relationship with God. Because there has been moments in my life when I have run away. You know, in my own heart, in my own emotions, there are times when I run away from God and I get discouraged and and perhaps some of you encounter the same thing where you feel like running away and and what God offers is it's not easy to do. It's easier to run away. Because there's so much responsibility, especially in this case, Nineveh. Now let me tell you a little bit about Nineveh. It's when the Bible says there is this wickedness in Nineveh. Ah, if you say Nineveh at that time, Nineveh, that's where Assyrians live. These are Gentiles. And the Israelites know who they were. They were pagans. They scary people. Uh, the city of Nineveh is like 20 miles long and it's known for its walls, and it's 100 feet high, and the walls of, around Nineveh, it's surrounded by walls, and they said three chariots can be driven on top of the walls. That's how thick. So it's a scary, scary city. But then it, God said, wicked city. It's amazing that from heaven, God looks down, and He sees what is happening. And God feels for what is happening. When, you know, what is happening in Nineveh was, was so terrible. The, their wickedness, literally it says, their wickedness has reached a high degree or the highest pits. Nineveh is like a septic tank that smells all the way to the heavens. That's how bad Nineveh was. And God is aware. I mean, God is aware of that wickedness that's going on in there. What kind of people live in Nineveh? We really, really wicked ones. Uh, they were Assyrians, and Assyrians known for their cruelty. 
You know, in Nahum 3, you don't have to go there, but Nahum 3, verse 3 to 4, if you want, you can go to Nahum 3, <laughs> 3 to 4. We read about the, you know, this rated R now, right? So close your ears if you are to chicken about hearing this. And the Bible says, we read about, you know, dead, the dead lying in the streets, dead bodies, heaps of bodies everywhere. People would stumble over them, scramble to their feet and fall again. All this because Nineveh, the beautiful, faith, faithless city, mistress of deadly charms, and ties the nations with their beauty. There's something about big cities like Las Vegas. Big cities are always so exciting and, and attractive to people and people just totally miss the point and they just go there. She taught them all to worship her false gods and chanting people everywhere. Now, archaeology have discovered certain things to prove this. Certain accounts of the cruel, wicked treatments of captives found in the Assyrian records. The Ninevites were known for their savagery in plundering cities where they burned boys and girls and tortured adults, tearing from their bodies and, and then leaving them to die under the scorching sun. The Ninevites were that evil. They're like a nation of Jeffrey Dahmer and Hannibal Lecter. That's how it is. I mean, that's, you know, archaeology has discovered Monuments they built to their own cruelty. That's say, here's some of the things they found in, in, in stones and recorded. Many within the border of my land I flayed and spread their skins upon the walls, like Jeffrey Dahmer. And I cut the limbs of the officers, the royal officers who rebelled. Another monument stated, 3,000 captives I burned with fire. Even another cruel Ninevite wrote, I cut off their hands and their fingers, and from others, I cut off their noses, their ears, and their fingers, and of many, I put out their eyes. That's, that's the evil. See, the, that's the evil that's going on that God saw. No matter they're well known and their nations are scared of to go to, and no wonder when God said to Jonah, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh. It's like God telling you now, I want you to go to the Taliban and preach Jesus. <laughs> you know, how would you feel? So you can understand his reluctance uh, to get up and go. And it's not that, you know, we, we see that. But it's God. This God. I mean, Jonah didn't fully understand God's, what God can do in God's love. You know, we tend to think that the Old Testament God is different from the New Testament. It's the same God. Because here we see God's grace. Such wicked people, such terrible sin, God can forgive. And God wants to reach them. And God can do a revival in the lives of totally wicked people. And I think God chose Nineveh to show us the abundance the extravagance, the, the ridiculousness of God's love and mercy. Because these are people that you would hate, 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 you know. And then God looks down and says, I want you to preach to them so that they may come to me. That's our God. And then it fell on the lot of Jonah. Now there's only two kinds of life Christians have. Two roads, the road to Nineveh, our mission, or the road to Tarshish. Johnny said, the road to Jerusalem is another road or out of Jerusalem. The road to life, two choices we make. God says, I want you to go here. This is my mission. Do this, you know. In the same way, we have the road to life and the road to death. And then when it comes to our ministry, God has given us an instruction. He says, go and make disciples. So either we follow the road of obedience or the road of disobedience. Only two, two things. And I, I, was, I was looking at the Christianity today and I was just saying that the problem of Christianity today is not the lack of money. It's the lack of heart. You know, if Christians truly have a heart for God 
and for their mission that God gives them, there will be no problem. No problem. There will be no problem even if the work was early in the morning or what, you know, we will be so excited. But, you know, we get our priorities mixed up and when you go to, you know, you go to Vegas and you see a lot of Christians, you know, enjoying that probably more. And, our, you know, we go to Universal Studios and Christians probably standing in line for two hours for a one minute ride. You know, people buying advanced tickets for a movie they like, but... Then you look at the churches, not just this church, but almost a lot of churches, empty. You know, God sees and says, whoa, you know, something has got, to be, has got to be done. So, here is Jonah. So, he was challenged. Here he was challenged by God to go to Nineveh. But there is something that Jonah really could not comprehend. And uh, perhaps we also have our Nineveh. Somebody we don't like, Muslims. A lot of Christians don't like Muslims. Who are they? Gay and lesbian or whatever, you know, do we hate them so much? Who are these people? Whoever, they are our need of it. But, but God, God loves them. God cares for, for all humanity, all. No matter what sin they have committed, God has provided forgiveness for all. And He wants them to know that forgiveness. But He is including us. You see, God can easily broadcast from heaven. He wants to. He wants to. But God has chosen to, to invite us. He has chosen to have us participate in the work that He's doing. And so He also sent us and says, I want you to go. Perhaps your Nineveh is your neighbor out there. You know, your friends out there, your enemies. And that's how compassionate the heart of God is. Compassionate. Man. What about people who betrayed you? Can you love them? I mean, this is something that, you know, this is a sermon given yesterday in L.A. And, and uh, talk about Jesus and Ju Judas. Now, the Bible there in the scripture, it says that, Jesus knew, even at the early stage, that Judas is going to betray Jesus. But when you read the story, there was nothing in the story where Jesus was impartial or discriminatory against Judas. He treated all the disciples, 12 of them, fairly, even the betrayer. Jesus loved Judas as much as he loved Peter. And that is the abundance of the grace. He was not picky. He loves even the one who betrayed. It's too bad that Judas did not fully understand that. So in this, this case, I think this is recorded for us. The story of Nineveh showed truly how abundant, how exceeding great is God's compassion, is God's love towards people, whoever they are, whoever. And God, it's a lesson for us to, Jonah was comfortable with his life. Going to Nineveh was tough. So he would rather run away. Sometimes for Christians, when we feel safe already, and then we hear a lot of messages about our security in Jesus Christ, that God has done everything for us, we are safe we are secure in our eternal destiny. And we say, let them take care of themselves. Let them bomb each other. Let them just suffer. We pass by streets and we see people suffering in the street. We say, they deserve it. It's their fault. I mean, we become indifferent. Indifferent. That's a problem sometimes we have. And in this case, with Jonah, there was really no love and concern for the people of Nineveh. But God does have. That's why he commanded John, uh, Jonah. He said, go. So let's continue the story here uh, in, in, uh, in Jonah. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God. 
and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. So here we see that when we choose to go away from God, life will basically keep going down. Jonah went down to Joppa. He went down to the ship. And then he went down into the sea. And then he went down into the belly of the fish. And then he went down into the deep. Down, down, down. Life away from God, or running away from God, is down, 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 down. That's what life is. We may not realize this, but that is what's going to happen. Away from God is just keep on going down, down, down. The story of King David. Remember the time when he, his life went down, he saw Bathsheba. Down he was in temptation. And down he had a relationship. And down he went and killed, killed the, wife, the husband. And down he, he lied about it. He kept on going down, going down. Away from God, away from enlightenment, there is degeneration. And people don't realize it how slowly from, from purity and holiness and innocence, they don't even maintain in their character, but it goes worse and worse and worse. It goes into what the Bible calls wickedness. God doesn't want that to happen. God doesn't want us to happen. He wants us to be in His presence. He wants us to be with Him. And the fact is, Jonah ran away. And uh, he found a ship. Probably there's plenty of ship. Just because there are ships available there, doesn't mean God provided the ship. You know, the, even the enemy will probably create circumstances where we may think, ah, oh, maybe God gave me the ship, you know. There are times when those things and it is not. There will be along the way, as we go down, down, and down, and, and then somebody, you know, will come along the way and tempt us further. You become romantically involved with somebody that should not be. And there will always be that caring person who would seem to care for you, but not really want something else. There is always the, the easy way to make more money, but it will stop you from doing ministry or having a relationship with God. There's a way that gives you more fun maybe than church, but it's not the way of God, but it's the way of death. There's always be the ship that's going to wait for you to carry you away from your ministry, to carry you away from God. I mean, in this case, as in Jonah. So we may find our ship, but it's not always, you know, God's. It's not. It goes to Tarshish. But God, when God calls us to go to Nineveh, although that's a terrible city, at least in this case, that was Jonah's ministry. It was. So to know this, I think it's good to know for Jonah, and it's good for us to know too. It is very expensive to disobey God. It is very expensive to run away from God. You know the story of the prodigal son. He ran away from the father, and down, 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 down he went, right? Until he was eating food for the pig. To that extent, down, down, down. Running away from God is expensive. It might even create sicknesses. We don't know, put in jail or, or whatever problem. Down, down, down life is. But God doesn't want us to happen. He wants us to be with Him. Because with God is joy. With God is comfort and life and joy eternal. But away from God, you will always pay for your own fare, like that ship with Jonah. And you're never going to get to where you thought it will be good. Away from God? No. So that's, that, that was the situation. It's a life, a life of running away from God is a life that is just to totally horrible. So it's a choice that we make, and that's, that's why I chose this, this message for us. Wrong way, Jonah. And I thought that the message of Brother Johnny here also fits with this one. When the disciples finally 
heard Jesus, when they heard him speak, their eyes were, were open. And instead of running the wrong way, they went back to where their mission was. The great commission that God has given in Matthew 28. Go you therefore and make disciples. That is the great commission. I'm so glad he didn't call it uh, the great suggestion. You know, it's never the great suggestion. It's the great commission. What is a commission? It, what is a commission? Something that we, we are committed to. Something that we obey. You know, that's God's. We're not talking here about salvation issue. We're talking about our relationship with God. This is about our response to what God has done in our lives. So here we see in verse 4 and 5, God sent the great wind and the sea, and uh, the ship was broken up and so forth. Uh, and, uh, and so they, they had a, you know, they tried to find out who was the culprit, and uh, they found out it was Jonah. And they couldn't believe. What? They couldn't believe that here was Jonah who received an instruction from God and, and they knew because Jonah said, I am the servant of this Lord of Israel and so forth. And they have heard of this God of Israel and they could not believe that Jonah would disobey that God. Sometimes unbelievers can be, they seem to be believing more, you know. <laughs> they seem to believe more, I mean, in that case. Um, there's a story that I let me relate that happened uh, in the south where, uh, in Texas, where a man started to build a bar, you know, bar, in front of a local church. And so the local church gathered their forces and started putting this placard, walking around and said, and, and then the pastor said, let's pray that this bar will not continue that it will not flourish. They were just all praying and praying that it will not continue. And lo and behold, a lightning hit that bar and burned to the ground. And so the owner was upset. He, he went to the courts and sued the church in front. He sued them and said, it's their fault. Because they were encouraging people to pray to God to get my bar burnt down. And so now I was hit in, with lightning, burned down. It's their fault. So it went to the courts. And then the, uh, the church leader said, no, 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 you know, uh, we don't think so. You know, they said, you cannot equate the lightning with our prayers. You know, they were trying to es escape. <laughs> said, it's not us, it's not us, you know. And the judge was, made a decision and said, based from all your testimonies and so forth, what I can see is that it seems that the, the owner of the bar believes in miracles more than the church. <laughs> <laughs> There's a danger sometimes being, you know, being in church where we hear the word of God so many times. We read and read and read and it becomes like has no more effect. Jonah being a prophet probably has read the scriptures and at that time it was written and, and the power of God and the reality of God has come to no effect. So this, this is a message for us from God says, wake up. God is real. God is real here. He is. And when God says something, we listen because God shows us here there is a God who is a God of love he cares he cares for humanity he has such grace that even the totally wicked as in Nineveh he will forgive and he can create and do a revival instantly if God wants to but it took more time to convince the Christian in this case Jonah and even he was reluctant he went to Nineveh anyway he was still complaining you know, this is what I'm afraid of, that they will repent, you know, <laughs> towards the end. I was scared that if I preach, they will repent, you know. It was kind of mumbling, but God still did His work of converting the whole city. That in spite of us, God will still do His work. But God still wants us to be a part of it and, and get involved. Get to be a part of the work that He's doing. So the choice is us. May it be that we don't lose our passion.
Because even Jesus Christ says, if salt has lost its saltiness, it is no longer good for anything. So it is from Jesus. Are we losing our saltiness? Let us bring back that first love that God has given us. To really see people out there, there's, there's literally 7 billion people who are lost and needing help. Needing help. And God sees the church and sees us. And God says, like what Jesus says, Okay, here's my plan. Go to the Lord of the harvest. Ask and pray that God will send in more laborers. Send in more laborers. Probably they're like Jonah or probably they're like Moses or whatever. But send in more laborers and just pray and God will send them. So I encourage us to respond to God's call. Let's respond to God's call and pray for laborers and run, not the other way, not the wrong way, Jonah, but it's the right way, Jonah. Go to our mission. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, we thank you so much for being here with us today. And to know the story of Nineveh is a story of your love, story of grace. That you chose a nation, Lord, that is a nation of wicked people from our human perspective beyond help. But that's a lie because no one is beyond help. You love each and every one of us, Lord. You can create a revival in the hearts of people if only they hear. When, when Jonah spoke, they responded, Lord God. They responded. And there are many people, Lord, out there, if they will only hear the good news, they will respond also. Thank you, Lord, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.